Today, I have the pleasure on Critical Materials Corner speaking with Jack Lipton and Byron W. King. How are you both today? Well, thank you. Good, thank you. Today's conversation is going to be around a column you just recently wrote, Byron, titled Energy Rundown 2022, A New Year of Living Dangerously. Now, I just asked you a second ago before we started this interview, I'm going to ask it again, which is you have so many interesting comments in this particular column. What would you prioritize this morning as the most critical? Because there were numerous variables in here. I think everybody should read this, by the way. Well, the center of gravity here, you know, I mean, the kernel, the takeaway point is that uh, we collectively, society, and truly the whole world, we are on the edge of a cliff staring into the abyss of an energy disaster. Uh, it is, it, all the hallmarks are there. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, will uh, enough policymakers, will enough uh, industrial uh, side, you know, be able to come up with something that will literally, truly keep the lights on for the Western world? And, and for much else of the world, not just the West, but I mean, I mean, we, you know, we, we speak to a Western sort of audience an investment oriented audience, but I mean, I mean, if you, if you haven't figured out that we're in an energy crisis, I'm telling you, we are, and we can talk about it for the next, you know, 20 minutes. And of course, I received a number of emails between the two of you after you published this column and Jack, you had numerous insightful things to say. Would you like to comment on what this cliff that we're staring at right now that Byron is referencing? Yes, I, I think this, uh, this cliff is self-made and, and I think it represents a outstanding lack of understanding by the political uh, leaders of the Western world in, in, in how to even address this issue. They don't understand resource economics, they don't understand mineral economics, and they certainly don't understand energy and economics. Yet these people are, we're entrusting to make these decisions about our future energy supplies. And I think the one thing that stands out to me is their total disregard for Africa, South America, India. These are places where cheap energy could bring about the revolution in, in lifestyle and standard of living that we in the West enjoy. If we continue on this path to so-called green energy, we destroy the chances of those places to develop. And I don't think they're going to go willingly. Let me just add to that, Jack. Perfect point. Absolutely. But just the term green energy is a lie. I mean, there's nothing green about green energy. You know, the idea, oh, I'm going to collect the sun. I'm going to collect the wind. The things that you need to collect the sun and, the, and collect the wind are made with energy. You know, the, the mining, the processing, the transport, the building, the construction, et cetera. You know, the, the concrete base, I mean, concrete is nothing but energy. I mean, it is, it is limestone, you know, burnt down to lime uh, mixed with gravel and water, et cetera. I mean, uh, concrete is a highly energy, energy intensive material and that's your foundation. Then you throw in the steel, which is, you know, a high heat uh, substance. You know, you, you cannot make basic steel out of basic iron or, you know, uh, economically, with electrically, I mean, pretty much all the basic steel in the world is made with you know carbon inputs. You can remelt it as scrap with you know carbon uh, arc furnaces, but but the basic stuff you need carbon for. So the, the whole green thing is a lie. It's a branding mechanism, you know. And that's before we get to the to the rare earths to the, that go into the magnets and the other exotic metals, you know, the the silver. It, it, this is all a product of uh, of, of essentially carbon based energy that goes into mining it. And frankly, if we, you know, just we, if we just measured up all the metals and materials in the world that we think we're going to need to build out this green world by 2030, 2035, give me a number, pick it up. There's just, there's just not enough. And even if there is enough, it's, there's, it, you know, you're, you're talking about, 
you know, mining, mi mining everything that's mineable on the face of the earth, basically, to make it happen. So, so in a sense, the the you know the energy future of the world is a is a is a fantasy, and it is a lie. Although, since this is investor intel, it's highly investable, and so you know, I mean, we can we can always make some money off of other people's delusions. So let me just jump in here. Of course, Investor Intel with both of you, of course, are providing excellent data on where we really are because you have to have the data before you can move forward. But let's talk about solutions with our, you know, with this energy scarcity. And I'm going to throw it back at you, Byron, to lead. And then, you know, Jack, obviously, I, we want your feedback. How are we going to deal with this? And how can we help the greenies sleep at night? It, it, you know, some people are going to have to back away from, you know, from, from, from the paradigms that they're, that they're living with. I mean, uh, there, there's nothing green about green. There's nothing renewable about renewable. I mean, let's let's sh let's shift the argument a little bit. You know, renewable could be rebuildable. You know, it could be recyclable. Uh, you could, you know, you can you can maybe approach it that way. Um, but uh, uh, the the idea that we have to just you know turn the valves and shut it all off at the at the at the carbon level. You know, no more natural gas, no more oil no more coal or whatever, you're really setting yourself up for failure. I, I, I know that pe some people out there absolutely don't want to hear this, but I mean, I mean, unless you can really come up with a whole new concept of thermodynamics, and unless you can just sort of uninvent the last 200 years of the industrial revolution, um, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up to fail and you're setting yourself up to, to literally wreck the economy, wreck the society that we live in. And I don't just mean the US society, I mean US Canada, I mean US Canada, Western Europe, Japan, look, and China too. Um, and uh, it, it's all, uh, it, 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 it's all in play. Uh, the, uh, you know, bad energies, energy decisions are in play uh, across the world. Um, and, uh, and, you know, where we go from here, uh, you know, realistically, I mean, you know, you can you can just say, okay, well, we are going to have to mine the copper and mine the nickel and mine the rare earths. You know, we're going to have to build a rare earth industry in the United States or in the U.S., Canada, U.S., Canada, Europe, what have you, because we're not going to get what we need out of China. China has plenty of uses for everything they can produce on their own, you know, uh, you know, uh, I suppose if you want to look at it as a, as a win-lose sort of thing. The bad news for China is that it's an energy poor country. I mean, they have not that much oil, not that much natural gas. They mine a lot of coal, but that's not enough. Uh, stupidly, they shut off their Australian coal imports over, you know, some sort of perceived insult that the Australians asked about where did this Chinese, where did this virus come from thing, you know, uh, had to do with Wuhan. Uh, they, oh, we're not going to import your coal anymore. Great. So now, now Indonesia has shut off coal exports because you know, they, they're, their power plants were running low. So, I mean, China is an energy poor country right now, and that's a problem for China, but it's also a problem for the rest of the world because China is the world's workshop. Uh, but getting back to, you know, how do, how do, how do we, you know, what, what can we do going forward? We can be very positive about the Western ability to rebuild uh, the mines and the mineral industry and the materials industry that it's going to need to do uh, energy moving forward. Uh, at the same time, you, you're, you're going to have to also accept the idea that uh, we still have to we still have to produce natural gas and oil, and 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 certainly there's a lot of coal left to be mined and, and combusted. Do it do it do it much more. Um, do do it do it better. Do it whatever you know. Okay, yeah, we'll do it better. But uh, I, 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 seventy years ago, but yeah, sure. I think what you're saying, and this is my view that we're actually at war with the earth. What we're doing, this, you know, you're speaking of how are we going to produce all of the materials necessary to do this transformation? That would be by high grading and low grading everything. In other words, draining the earth of its mineral resources for this momentary fantasy will actually destroy our future. I think that's what people need to understand. Could we produce this all this material necessary for this transformation? No. But in trying to do it, we destroy our own future. 
because in that future, and we're bringing, the more we produce today, the closer the disaster is coming. And that disaster will be extremely expensive resources, which will limit their use dramatically. And, and I think that the only solution is to be rational. Let's find an equilibrium point. Baseload energy, coal, oil, gas, nuclear, and alternate energy where it's most efficient and useful. Places where it's too expensive to hardwire, that as the Chinese are doing in, in their Gobi Desert region with wind turbines. But the idea of simply transforming an energy industry that it's been, that's been developed and growing for nearly two centuries, suddenly in a few, and by high grading out the, the resources of Mother Earth is nuts. We're gonna kill Mother Earth and in the process, destroy our future. So we've got to slow down and maximize efficiency here. We have to take a look at our natural resources and say, how much of these can we mine sustainably? I love that term. In other words, can we continue to mine at a level that allows us to maintain our society and add others in the world to it? That's the problem. And is it investable? Absolutely. Because we have to find more sources of lithium, cobalt, rare earths, and we, we have to find ways to develop them without destroying our own future. That's, that's my opinion. Well, one, one, one absolute uh, you know, factor in all of this has to be the price signals. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year in 2021, the, the highest gaining commodity on the whole list of anything was lithium, for, you know, for example. Right. Uh, that was up something over 400%, but that depends on you know, if you were the one who paid 800% versus you know, 300%. I mean, lithium was up remarkably last year right now as we speak you know as 2022 commences uh, another metal that's up significantly is nickel for example uh nickel prices are as high as they've been in you know a, a long time you know it's, it's funny because I, I look at the price of gold every day and it's sort of been trading in that in that range in that zone well you, you don't you don't build electric cars out of gold i guess but you do need you know nickel batteries lithium batteries and you know those, those things are those things are going out of sight. The price of rare earths uh, are are also uh, you know moving up into record territory. You know, Jack, you've been talking about this for decades. I, you know, you and I've been talking about this for many years, Tracy, as well. Um, uh, and and China has completely restructured its own internal rare earth industry to to build a stronger uh, business case for what they have. And so you can see prices going up there with rising prices. Uh, you know, uh, people are going to have to make their make their own decisions. But rising prices also face the this Federal Reserve and this European bank that's just willing to just throw these invented dollars into the furnace as well. And so, uh, it's so distorted by uh, you know easy money, you know, below zero interest rates, things like that. So, gentlemen, I, I, I'm jumping in. We've got time for one last little debate here. Let's talk about China. OK, you, both of you, I, I, I have the advantage of hearing some of your commentary behind the scenes. Talk, share with our audience what you have been debating about whether or not we can actually compete with China. I can I can summarize it. Uh, China has been on a war footing in the, in the energy space for the last 25 years. And guess what? They're winning. And we are, not, we are not the enemy. The enemy is the world economy. They want to participate and they want, they want to be as rich as they can. And, and, and they're doing an excellent job. They have addressed this issue for 25 years. And what we have to understand in America is that wars end. And they end with the winner being the one who still got resources we didn't we didn't the united states didn't win world war ii because because it was better politically let's say than the germans i'm gonna get a lot of crap on this but we won because we outclassed them in resources they were bankrupt at the end the british empire was bankrupt the united states was not 
we're, China is making sure in the next bankruptcy of the world, they are, they are not a victim. That's what's going on here. We have to wake up, stop the war. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I know what you mean, Jack. I, I think what you really meant to say was politically, we were better than Germany. Absolutely. And, and industrially, too. We outproduced the hell out of In them. In particular, industrial. Know, because I, 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 you know, not, I don't want to get off on that tangent, but I mean, I think it's I, pretty self -evident. I have to make one comment. Yeah. I believe, as Victor Davis Hansen does, that in 1939, Germany was bankrupt. The war was over before it started. It, we don't want to be in that position. Yeah, well, you know, that, I mean, that's that that is a deep argument that yes. well, we can talk about that. But let's get back to <laughs> rare earths uh, right now. I mean, for all of the, you know, the discussion for all of the Wall Streeting that, that goes on of you know, rare earths in the U.S. and in Canada, you know, we have some really great ideas. We really we have some great ore deposits. You know them. I I mean, can I? I'll, I'll mention names: Appia uh, uh, Minerals and you know Defense Metals and Vital Metals and you know uh, some yeah. really great ideas out there. Um, and we have some people who are really smart about you know we can take the take the ore and we can make this and do that and downstream. But we really don't. We don't have a system that's up and running yet. There are some you know bench scale prototype scale things out there. We don't have nearly the uh, ability to turn the rocks in the ground. I mean, here's a, here's a piece of ore from British Columbia. That's beautiful monazite ore from Wichita, British Columbia. I have to keep it on my desk, but uh, we don't have, we don't have the ability to turn this into, you know, the magnet that you need for your car. When I say we, I'm talking the U S Canada uh, uh, for them. You know, I mean, there, there's little, there's little experimental bits here and there and there, but it's, it's not there. So in that sense, China is not just years ahead, it is a generation and maybe more right. ahead in terms of, of its uh, ability to process these materials. So it gets back to what we talked about at the beginning, Tracy and Jack. If we're gonna have this energy revolution, we're gonna need some tools with which to revolutionize. And we simply do not have, we, US, Canada, Western Europe, do not have the tools that are necessary to fight this war. We don't have the weapons we need to wage this war uh, for industrial uh, uh, parity, let alone industrial, you know, victory. And uh, you know, do not do not think that the world World War II model uh, applies. That we're going to form some big wagon train and you know move across the prairies and and, and you know uh, and, and win the war. And you know we, we're not even building the wagons. We don't even have the horses to to pull the wagons that we need. So uh, it's this is a downbeat. Uh, discussion in a sense, the I, you know the flip side of it is that uh, you know we're we're trying to we're trying to get the word out to 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 viewers, listeners, audiences out there, so that you understand that this isn't a game. This isn't just the investment game. You know, we're not some other video game to, to to play or something like that. I mean, I mean, if you the car in your driveway, the car's driving down the street, the car you're going to buy, um, it's 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 not going to be there uh, when when you need it. Uh, if, if we don't if we don't get the basic materials that the, that these companies need to do what they want to do, what they say they want to do. So I'd like to thank you both. This is a recap on the Byron King column this week, titled "Energy Rundown 2022: A New Year of Living Dangerously." Thank you both for joining us on Critical Materials Corner. Okay, thank you. <laughs>